Hello, everyone, and thank you so much to in, uh, joining us today with the American Family Insurance Dream Bank, um, where we believe in the transformative power of dreams. My name is Andy Frisky. I'm a senior dream curator with Dream Bank, and on behalf of the team, we are thrilled to have you with us here today. Before we go ahead and get started, we always like to poll the audience, uh, asking where people are tuning in from today and encourage you to do so in the chat. And before we go ahead and kick things off, for those of you maybe who aren't familiar with DreamBank, we'd love to take a few moments and share a little bit with you. So here at American Family Insurance, we believe that communities are stronger and the future is brighter when people are actively pursuing their dreams. That's why DreamBank was created. It's an inspirational community destination and digital experience that is dedicated to dreamers everywhere. Our offerings are designed to help you celebrate the dream journey, overcome obstacles, and stay motivated. But I'd like to go ahead and introduce uh, all of you to our speaker today. Let me, before I go ahead and do that though, let me see. Okay, perfect. Everyone is here. Um, so our speaker today is Tara L. Fletcher. She is the author of Flex Your Freelance, an unconventional guide to quit your day job. Tara is a fulfilled entrepreneur, wife, and mother. Like you, she juggles multiple responsibilities every day, but she believes everyone can make time for their dream job. Tara started her first business at 15 and was awarded Entrepreneur of the Year in 2012. Today, Tara will present 10 things new and aspiring entrepreneurs need to know. Please help me welcome Tara L. Fletcher. Tara, I'm going to go ahead and kick it over to you. Take it away. Thank you. Thanks for the warm welcome. I appreciate that. Andy, are you able to spotlight me on your end too, please? Awesome, thank you, appreciate that. Okay, hello everyone, welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I'm really excited to talk to you about entrepreneurship. It is definitely something that I am passionate about. Um, I started my first business, as I said, when I was 15 and it's something that has been in my blood definitely ever since. I was raised by entrepreneurs, so it's very much in my blood. Um, this is a bee wolf, hopefully I didn't startle or scare anyone by showing you a, a bee right now. <laughs> but I wanted to tell you about the bee wolf because it, it is a fascinating creature that can teach us a really powerful lesson. So a bee wolf can carry large stones, even larger than its own body, in order to dig out their nests. So bee wolves actually burrow into the ground and can remove what would be equivalent to a couple of our handfuls of, of materials in order to create their nests. So what they do is they build their nest, each has an individual hole, and they're eight to 12 inches apart. Sometimes they'll have a dozen or so nests together in the, in the same area. And occasionally as they're, as they're constructing their nest, the bee wolves will fly up and circle the area, just do a quick perimeter check to make sure they recognize where they are. One of the reasons why they do that, it's really important for them to know exactly where they need to get back to. Because once they're carrying their prey and they're returning to their nest, it requires a lot of energy for them to fly back up, do that check and make sure they know where they are and find their correct location. I thought their story was an interesting one to tell because of that reason, because the, the bee wolf teaches us that if you can't quite find where you're going, where you wanna be, sometimes you gotta go up a little bit higher get a view of the situation around you, and then recalibrate yourself in a sense from there to figure out where you want to go. So pretty cool example for us to, to think about. Uh, and we're going to talk about that today a little bit. We're going to get this opportunity to do exactly that, to get that 10,000 foot view, to go up a little higher, and we're given permission to daydream. I really am excited to be a part of, of Dream Bank because I know that's something that's really important to them is that we do live our dreams. So my first suggestion here for, for anyone who is interested in um, trying to start their own business, wherever you are on your entrepreneurial journey, I want to let you know that it is okay to dream. And if you are so inclined, feel free to go ahead and put for us in the chat what, what your side hustle is, what your business is that you're trying to get going. I'd be curious to see um, if we've got some specific ideas. If you're not sure what that is yet, that's fine. Uh, but if you have a specific idea, go ahead and put that dream in the chat for us. And then step two that we want to talk about here, step two of being able to live our dream is to get that daydream then out of your head and onto paper. How do we do that? How do we get our dream out of our head? Well, one of the first steps is going to be to write a business plan. Maybe that's not what you were hoping to hear today. Maybe you just wanted to stay in that dream space and talk about the daydream. That's fine. Go ahead, imagine that for a moment. What it's going to look like, what it's going to sound like, what it's going to smell like, what it's going to feel like to really launch your own business if you haven't already done so. 
but let me share this with you. You are two and a half times more likely to actually get into business if you have a formal plan. Don't be overwhelmed by this concept. A business plan of today can be a very, very simple document. A business plan of today can start with a business description, include an objective statement, your overall business strategy, highlight your products and services, and then also include a marketing and sales plan. Uh, of course, an important part of it is going to be our financials as well. Uh, and for me, that was a big part of where I started when I started with getting my business put together was the financial side of things. Okay, I see in the chat, a few of us are not sure, not sure what our business plans are yet, what our ideas are, and that's okay. When I was first getting started, I knew I didn't like where I was. I knew I needed to do something different, but I wasn't sure how do we get from where I am to where I want to be. So I tell you what, I had a dozen ideas probably. I'd wake up in the middle of the night with a new idea, and I just kept trying different things until something really stuck. So that's okay if you don't know what your exact direction is yet, you're still gonna find value in this. And in the planning process as well, when it comes to putting that dream together, getting it on a piece of paper, what it might look like, your focus at this point in time, maybe it's something like mine was at that point in time. My, my focus was, I, I wanna quit my day job. That was my focus. I wasn't happy where I was. And that's okay if that's where that, that starts for you. But we're going to give you some hopefully concrete steps of what can we do to move from that place to get closer to where we want to be. So thank you for sharing. Please do continue to type your thoughts in the, in the chat. We'd love to hear them. So get your dream out of your head, get it on paper. Uh, when it comes to the financial aspect of things, that was something that I knew having a family, I wasn't going to just um, start a new business, quit my day job without having a plan in place. So that plan is going to be what gets you that bridge from where you are to where you want to go. Step three in our 10 things aspiring entrepreneurs need to know, or the third item here on the list is to honor your personal sovereignty. Okay. What does that mean? So our personal sovereignty, that means a, a few different things to me. Uh, I came across a really interesting um, blog when I was at this, this point in my life where I was in this big juncture and I was like, oh, I don't know what I want to do, where I want to go. I just know something, something has to change. And I came across this blog. I want to say it was Hobie Bagwar was her name, The Fluent Self. I think that's what it was. But basically the concept came down to this. You need to honor your personal sovereignty. You need to decide who am I as a person, what is most important to me, and what am I not going to budge on? Because anytime we find ourselves in that uh, major, major juncture in life, we're at a fork in the road and we were trying to decide where am I gonna go next? What's my next step going to be? We need to make sure that we set boundaries and knowing where, where our limits are. So in that, in that blog, uh, she mentioned things like, um, what your, your personal sovereignty is. So imagine if you are a sovereign nation, what laws, what rules are going to apply to you or be true to you no matter what, regardless of the situation, regardless of what other changes might be taking place? What is going to be true for you no matter what? So for me, that was things like, someday I'll never go on another job interview. It was things like, I will not have to explain to people why I don't have a formal four-year degree. On my personal sovereignty list was also things that were very personal to me. Things like, I get to drink really good tea because that tea symbolized for me, not just uh, something that I enjoy drinking, I still enjoy drinking tea, but it was about my morning ritual. It was about my routine. It was about taking time for myself because I would get up in the morning. I like to be the first one up in my house. I like to get my tea started, boil my water, steep my tea and, and have my time to read, to reflect. Uh, I like to stretch in the morning too. So that tea was all part of this routine. So my personal sovereignty list was things like, I get to drink really good tea. It was also something that I was not going to not going to apologize for. On my personal sovereignty list, I had things like, I will not lie for my boss. I'm not going to lie for someone I work with. And that was important to me because it starts in the small things. For me, it started with things like, tell them I'm not here. Did you ever have that? Did you ever have that boss who was like, tell them I'm not here? Like, well, okay, it might seem like a small thing, but that's not truthful. And that didn't fit with my own personal sovereignty. That didn't fit with my 
personal values. So if you're thinking of something right now that you know you would want to put on your personal sovereignty list, something that you want to stay true to, wherever you are in your career path, wherever you are in that journey, go ahead and put that down in the chat. Share that with us as well. We'd love to hear that. It could be something personal. It could be something professional. What is it that you want to hold true to no matter what? So also in that honoring your personal sovereignty, along with that thought, I like to consider what makes you who you are. Because it's really important for an aspiring entrepreneur to know exactly who they are and what they stand for in a professional sense as well. So when I think about that, I think of what is your, your they call it a USP or a UVP, your unique selling proposition or unique value proposition. What is it that makes you unique? What problem could you be solving in the market? What is something that you can do that no one else is doing yet? A lot of businesses come out of this problem solving space, not necessarily because they have a product or a service they wanna highlight, but it's because they want to find that spot in the market, find that position and fulfill their own personal sovereignty. So think about that. Also think about if you were to be, this sounds really morbid, but if you were not here tomorrow as, as a business, if you were not here as a professional tomorrow, what would be on the tombstone of your company? What would be something that you would want to be known as or known for? And if that's hard to grasp, think about your co favorite companies. What companies do you really like? What brands do you really like? What stores do you really like? Who do you follow on social media? Think about that. Why? What is their value? What is the quality that you feel like you're taking on when you're a part of that product, when you purchase from that company? Um, the first one that comes to my mind when I think about that is, is Tom's and their one-for-one -one model with shoes. If you're not familiar, you purchase shoes, they give shoes to someone in need. So that would be one that, that shows who they are in a really unique way. That would certainly be on the tombstones. If, if Tom's disappeared, that would certainly be on their tombstone. Their mission and what they did would be something we would definitely remember about them. So when we think about this third step of honoring your personal sovereignty, also think about that. What makes you different? What makes you unique? What is your unique selling proposition? If you had to narrow it down to the biggest benefits that you offer, how you could address the pain of your customers or performance gap, those would be really powerful in helping to position your business in the market because that's something you need to be able to communicate. So along with that, can you offer proof? Are there specifics? Do you have statistics, examples, or testimonials that speak to why what you do is unique? Those are really powerful for our selling, whether it's in person, on our website, digital materials, physical collateral, answer those questions and you'll be a lot more likely to sell your, sell your product. Let's talk about that USP, unique selling proposition, unique value proposition, just for a moment. Um, we talked about addressing examples as far as the pain of your customers or the performance gap. So our unique selling proposition doesn't necessarily have to be or have to do with the product or service itself. Um, I think of some that were, are based on speed, are based on time. Um, perhaps it's uh, sub so fast to freak, freaky fast subs. You know, their, their slogan was about the time. The pain that customers were feeling was not getting their lunch fast enough. It's during the workday. I, I need to get my lunch quick. I don't have anything with me. It's got to be something that's fast. How can you address the pain of your customers or the performance gap? And then offer proof, offer statistics, examples, or testimonials that are going to show that, are going to show that, that are going to highlight that difference that you have to offer. All right, we're gonna move, move ahead here and we're gonna talk about my next four items that you need to know, or excuse me, next three items you need to know. So number four is to meet with experts. I am not a financial expert. I worked in accounting for five years. It was um, not my favorite. <laughs> I am not a financial expert. I also found that as an entrepreneur, as a solopreneur, I am, I'm by myself a lot. So it's really hard to keep yourself accountable. It can be a really big challenge to uh, know what you should be doing with your money. So it's really important to find financial experts who you can trust, who can help you to set goals, can help you to know what to measure, which goes along with that. My, my step four would definitely include 
measure everything or keep track of everything. So who would be on this list as far as a financial expert or a money expert? You need to have a good accountant. If you're an entrepreneur, you need to have a good accountant. Ta tax law is constantly changing. There is no way you can keep up. I did my own taxes before. Uh, my husband and I are both self-employed now. Before that, when we were still working for other companies, I did taxes myself. It was pretty simple process. After you have a business, you need to have an accountant. What you pay them to help with your taxes is going to more than pay for itself because they'll help you to know what do I keep track of? How do I keep track of what category does this product go into that I purchased for my business? Is this a small tool? Is this something I need to depreciate? Those are all the questions for your accountant. So you have to find one that you that you trust. Meet with an accountant off season. So right now it's uh, May 17th. I don't know the accountants in, in my life if they're still if they're still really busy at this time of year, but I would think they would be starting to slow down a little bit. If you meet with an accountant on the off season, especially for your initial consultation, in most cases, they're not even gonna charge you for that. Just call them up and say, hey, uh, this is what I'm thinking of doing. I wanna start a business. I wanna make sure I'm keeping track of things the right way. Could you meet with me and help me figure that out? Most of them won't charge you for that. They'll only charge you for your tax prep fees. So consider reaching out to them. Who else would be on this list of experts for meeting with financial or money experts? A financial advisor. I think it's really important to meet with a financial advisor. You don't have to have a ton of money to meet with a financial advisor. This is kind of a funny thing to me because some of, sometimes my friends actually tease me about this. Oh, Tara is a financial advisor. Yes, yes I do and I'm very proud of it and you should too. You should have a financial advisor. Again, we can't know everything and our money needs to be working for us. And it's really helpful to have that external person that's helping to hold you accountable. Financial advisor will meet with you and say, what are your goals? Do you wanna be able to retire at a certain point in life? Do you want to take vacations? Do you want to, they'll ask you those questions and help you figure out what, what you need to set aside and where your money should go. I find it helpful to be able to break down my category and say, hey, do you see anything that looks off on my spending? Do I spend more than average percentage wise on, on groceries or on gas or whatever it might be? And look for opportunities to improve your finances, especially when you're first starting out. This is really important when you don't have a lot of money because you need to make what you do have stretch. And for me, it was probably five years before I really had felt like I had a steady income with my business. I was working uh, part-time for another company for two, two of the first years that I was getting my business going. So it's really important to have those experts on hand. Along with meeting those experts, not a financial expert necessarily, but many folks do recommend that you meet with an attorney, depending on what your business venture may be. An attorney might be helpful too, to make sure that you are, you're doing things legally, that everything is set up the right way. They can help you set up your initial contracts so they can help you with some of that paperwork too. So meet with financial experts, get with an accountant, a financial advisor, and also an attorney would be a, a good idea as well. Um, step five on here, or the of the top things that new and aspiring entrepreneurs need to know is to freelance. Freelancing is a great way to hone your skills, to try a wide variety of projects, to build your network, to build your portfolio, to build your website, and also even to just to branch out into different industries. Uh, I know a lot of uh, individuals who started their business freelancing because perhaps they just worked for one company and they designed one type of um, product for this one company and that was it. So you can't uh, start launch a business very easily in most cases without having more background experience in a wider variety of industries. So freelancing is a great way to do that. Although one caveat, make sure you check with the company you work with. If you still have a day job, there might be restrictions on when you can work, where you can work, or what you can do for work outside of your day job. So be aware of that too. Make sure you cover, <laughs> cover your butt in that case. Make sure that you know that you're allowed to freelance with your current contract and what you're doing. But a really good way to get started, to try out all those different avenues. And then six here, we talked about, um, when we were talking about finances, we talked about the importance of keeping track of everything. So this is so important that I'm bringing it back up again to, to charge what you're worth and keep track of everything. So there's really helpful tools out there. You don't have to buy expensive software 
to keep track of how you're running your business or to figure out what to charge. There's, a, there's more information available now than ever so that you can do some research to see what, for example, let's say you've got that question, how do I know what to charge? People ask that question all the time. Ask, find out who's doing what you want to do and ask them what they're charging. You can use online resources. Um, you could use hiring websites. You could use Glassdoor or Indeed or different sites like that to see what other people are charging just so that you can try to set your prices accordingly. Of course, when you're first starting out, you wanna charge what you're worth. Uh, that's in, gonna be in alignment with your experience level and where you're at. But that should be a number that you're going to continue to grow on a regular basis. You're going to continue to increase what, what you're charging. I know when I first started, I was not charging what I was worth. And I heard what other um, others were charging. And I was, just, whoa, I was blown away. Like, how could you charge that much? That just seems unreasonable. But keep in mind, as a freelancer or perhaps a consultant or whatever other work that you're doing, you're only getting paid for the work you actually do. So you don't necessarily get to charge anyone time for your own education, for the research that you have to do. If, if I need to learn how to do a new skill to be able to provide a service to one of my clients, I don't get paid for that learning time. I only get paid for the execution. And you get paid for the execution because of the experience that you have. So what might that look like, that charging what you're worth? I'll give you some advice. I remember I called my, my dad. I said I was raised by serial entrepreneurs. I called my dad one day and I said, how do I know? How do I know when it's time to raise my rates? And he gave me some really good advice. He said, if everyone says yes, you're probably not charging enough. Ooh. If you have too much work, it's a good time to raise your rates. And in fact, I found in my experience that when I raise my rates, it's a really good way to part with the clients I wasn't so happy about anyway. I found that as I raise my rates, I tend to get better clients. Now, if you need to build your portfolio and you're just getting started, by all means, go ahead and enter into the market in a little bit lower price point. But as you build and get more selective, as your skills improve, as you narrow down perhaps the industry that you're working on or the types of clients that you're working with, your, your rates should definitely increase and keep track of that. Um, I use Excel to keep track of a lot of the things that I do. Like I said, you don't really need fancy software. There's plenty of accounting software out there. I use Excel because that's what I know. I had told you I worked in accounting, so I learned how to use Excel. That's, so that's what I use. That being said, um, for my son's business, I have a 13-year-old and yes, he has a business already. He started his business when he was 12. So he's already got me beat. I was 15 when I first started my business, but my, my child, I took him to, to the credit union. And then we set up his business banking account, his business checking account, all in Google Docs, which works really well for him. There's a lot of pre-made templates that are out there. And he found that even easier to use than what I was doing in Excel to use a pre-made template. We took the template to the accountant. We said, hey, here's what we're thinking of using to keep track of his business. Does this work? Does, is this going to get you all the information that you need? So take that back to our, our meet with experts tip number four. And Keep your track, keep track of everything, bring it to your accountant and say, is this going to suffice? Is this going to get you all of the information that you need if I keep track of it this way? And do that right away. You don't want to wait a whole year and go to do your taxes and find out I put everything in the wrong column or the wrong category. That's a really tough way to learn. So keep track of everything, start right away, err on the side of keeping track of too much, and then check with your experts to make sure that you have everything you need in place. Okay, all right, bear with me one second. I'm just gonna swap swap my background here. I, there we go, trying to do two things at once, thank you. Okay, plan backward, what do I mean by that? Well, this is the point where I'd like to tell you the story about how I quit my day job and, because it's, it's really relevant at this point in time. So I had this moment working in accounting, little boy at home, I was done. I was at that point where I'm like, if I don't change something, I'm going to snap. Tara's gonna have a breakdown. So I did what any self-respecting 20 something would do at the time. I was at work, I got up, I closed my office door, I sat back down and I called my mom. Now, my mom is great, but she's not just any mom. Serial so entrepreneur mom, remember, called my mom and I said, mom, I'm done. I don't know what to do. 
I've got to quit this job, but I'm not making enough money to get my business to support me the way that I needed to do. So what do I do? And she gave me the best advice. She said, you have to pick a day. It doesn't matter what day it is. And that day might change, but you have to pick a day. Now, my experienced mother who's run multiple businesses for decades, she said, I have seen so many people wait until later in life and then they say, I wish I would have. I have seen so many people who never actually followed their dream, who never took the leap, who never quit their day job, and now they're not happy because they didn't try. So she said, you have to pick a day. So get out your calendar, put a big X on it, and pick a day. It doesn't matter what that day is. It does not matter if that day changes. The important thing is that you pick a day. Then you plan backwards. Okay, let's go back. We're in dream bank space right now. We're dreaming. Let's go back and think about this. Okay, what is your big dream? Can you imagine it? Can you see it? Can you smell it? Can you taste it? Whether it's quitting your day job, publishing a book, running a marathon, climbing a mountain, it doesn't really matter what your big dream is. Just picture that for a minute. Okay. Now you've got your day, you're gonna do it. The problem is, Tara, this is where I am right now. I'm right here. And what I want to do is go way, way over there. I can't see how to get through all this stuff between here and there. This is where mom's advice is golden. Mom said, plan backward. So live in that daydream. Think about that moment. Now ask yourself, okay, what is the last thing I need to do before I accomplish that big dream. Whether it's run a marathon, write a book, quit your day job, doesn't matter what the dream is, what is the last thing you need to do before you can take that step? For me, it was things like, okay, if I'm gonna quit my day job, I know I have to have this much money in the bank. I have to figure out insurance. That's gonna be really important. In fact, the date that I picked was the date right after my next dental appointment because I'm going to the dentist one last time before I gotta pay for it myself. So think about those important things. How much money do I need to have? How is my family gonna be taken care of? Am I gonna have insurance? Are we gonna be okay? Those things are important first. And if that means your dream has to wait a little longer, it has to wait a little longer. Take care of those things first. Okay, so you've got your day. The last thing before I quit, I've got to have insurance figured out. I've got to have a little bit of money in my bank. In order to do those things, what do I need to do just before that? We're planning backward. Okay, in order to have this much money in the bank, I'm going to have to make this money. To make this much money, I'm going to have to meet with this many clients. To meet with this many clients, I'm going to have to network with this many people. To network with this many people, I'm going to have to join the Chamber of Commerce. Um, I'm going to have to have coffee meetings. I'm going to have to attend events. Maybe in my case, it was, you know, young professional events that I went to, that sort of thing. Okay, now we've got some steps. Now we've got some strategies. So you've put that big X on your calendar. You're doing your big daydream and you know what that day is going to look like. What do you need to do one step before that? Now put that on your calendar. Put the step before it on your calendar and work backwards to today. There's something about that simple shift of focusing on working backward than there is from saying, here's where I am. How do I get to way over there? Because when you're in that big dream space, it's like you feel like I am at the top of this mountain. I am turning in my two weeks notice. I am ready to do the thing. So imagine you're at that pinnacle. It's a lot easy to plan backward because in a sense, you're rolling down that mountain. You're falling down from that peak. And now those little goals look a lot more manageable. Along with that, set goals. Set small, 
measurable goals and stick to them. In your backwards planning that we're talking about here, when you get down past the, the big things and into the nitty gritty, think about what are perhaps three things I need to do today or three things I need to do this week. Make a manageable chunks. I like to say like, like donut hole size goals or they're just pop. Well, you just easily like knock out half a dozen of them at a time, but don't overwhelm yourself. Start with just a couple a day or a couple a week. Get it in writing to hold yourself accountable and plan it backward. The other thing we're gonna talk about then too is time management. Clearly time management is going to be crucial for new and aspiring entrepreneurs. If you're trying to work and freelance or you're trying to get your business off the ground, you are busy. Andy told you when he introduced it that I'm busy. Yes, I'm busy. I, I don't know anyone who isn't busy. Our time is finite. So what do we do? We need to learn to best manage the time that we do have within our control. We all have circumstances that are beyond our control, situations and times that we cannot control. So we're putting all of that aside. We're putting aside all of our excuses and all of our rationalization. And we're gonna focus on what can I control? I was just listening to a podcast this morning and there was a big part about setting goals. And she made an interesting comment. She said, I asked myself when I'm 80 and I'm looking back, I'm gonna ask what was most important? What is gonna be that I want people to remember that I'm gonna feel like I accomplished at that stage in my life? She said, and when I look at what I'm doing now and how I'm spending my time, I realize how much I waste. I realize how much I waste. And in her example, she said one of the biggest things, the biggest time sucks for her was Facebook. What about you? How are you managing your time? So just as we evaluate our budget, just as we evaluate our diet, let's do an inventory of our time. If you were to jot down all the things that you spend your time on in the average day and the average week, how many of those non-essentials could you potentially eliminate? How many things that are on your planning list, your goal list, would you like to implement? Here's where that prioritizing comes in. So when it comes to managing time, okay, here's the five things we need to do to better manage our time. First one is prioritize. What can you cut? The second one is plan. I don't know about you, but if it's not in my calendar, it will not happen because I will not set aside the time. I will not make the time. And then by the time I sit down at night, I'm going to be too tired to do it. So I have to get it on the schedule. I have to plan it. The third thing we can do to better manage our time is to delegate. I get it. Delegating can be really hard. It can be a big challenge. But if you're not good at it, it's not important or you're not passionate about it, can you cut it from your list or can you pass it on to someone else? I have friends who own a, a cleaning company and I, I don't know, maybe this will surprise you, but some of the things that we don't like to do, other people genuinely enjoy. I have friends who like to clean. So if you feel like cleaning is taking up too much of your time and you'd like to dedicate a little time to spend on your business, maybe that's an option. Maybe you delegate that. Maybe it's household chores. One thing that I delegate in my house is Monday night dinners. I don't cook on Monday, my 13 year old does. And I will tell you, I here, I am Tara, I am a type A personality. I'm overly controlling, I'm a micromanager, I'm all those things. And I also wanna tell you that if I can do it, you can too because you have to empower someone else to take on this task. You were not an expert when you started. They will not be an expert when they started, but I guarantee you all my friends who have teenagers are jealous that my teenager makes dinner once a week <laughs> because I gave that to him, gave him the opportunity to learn how to do it, empowered him to choose what he wants, to put the things on the shopping list, put the things on the menu, and now he's more than happy to do it. What about in your professional life? Is there part of your, your job? Is there part of your business that you can delegate? We already mentioned some of the professionals, the finance people. Those are, in my opinion, those are essentials. Those have got to be covered. What about um, maybe it's social media management? Maybe you don't want to manage the social media for your business. Give it to a virtual assistant. 
there's some fantastic ones out there and they can be really, really affordable. And because they're so good at it, they'll work faster than you will and it'll free you up to do what you need to do where no one else can. Fourth one in managing your time is to focus. We have shrunk our attention spans. Uh, they are not expanding. Our attention spans are so short. Uh, re learning how to retrain ourselves to be able to really focus on the task we're in, in the moment to we'll be able to accomplish a lot more. How can we do that? Um, Michael Hyatt's book, it's on my shelf over there. Michael Hyatt's book, Free to Focus, really, really good one on the subject. If you're, if you're a reader, that's a great book. It helped me to remember why I need to focus on what I'm doing and to do my best. Um, I also sometimes find that when I'm really stressed out, that's when my focus is the worst. I have the hardest time focusing when I've got too much on my plate. So that's where having just a couple goals, two or three goals for the day are really helpful. Set those right in front of you. I like to put them on a little sticky note right in front of my monitor or right in front of my desk here so that I can say, okay, here are the three things that have to be done today. I'm going to make myself work on those three things before I get distracted by anything else. So focus is really important. Be at the task you're at when you're at it. Fifth, automate. Automation is a great way to better manage your time. What does automation look like? Well, if you ever say, gosh, there's got to be a better way to do this, there probably is. Which of your tasks can you automate? I had a, a gentleman who took one of my classes and he said that the hardest thing he has to do is when he has to send an email to tell someone no. So he put out um, RFPs, a request for proposals, and he would get all these submissions in and then he had to go back and tell people whether or not they were approved. Well, of course, most of them are no's. Most of the answer is a no. And he had a hard time crafting it because he said, how do I balance between saying no, saying that it's no right now, but also saying it's it's not no forever, it's just no for right now. So we worked on creating a template for just such a scenario. It, it doesn't sound like maybe something you could use a template for, but you absolutely can. Because then he could go, okay, here are all the messages I want them to make sure that they get. Here are the specifics for this RFP and why it was a no, I put the specifics in the template and now I can send it out. And now I'm also happier with the work that I have to do. So what parts of your job can you automate? Are there tools that you could be using to better manage? Are there um, time tracking programs that you could be using so you're not manually keeping track of your time perhaps or when you switch between, between projects? So manage your time, really, really important for entrepreneurs. Prioritize, plan, delegate, focus, and automate and you will better manage your time. Um, I also encourage you to create a not to-do list. If you are not good at it, it's not important and you're not passionate about it, don't do it. It's okay to make rules for yourself that way. Um, I do not sew. I hate to sew. I don't sew. I won't do it. If something needs to be repaired, I will just as soon give it away. Um, if it's something I really love, maybe I'll ask my, my sister or my mom or my, my adopted mom to help me with that. Otherwise, I'm like, no, it's just, I don't enjoy it. I'm not good at it. I'm not going to do it. If I will give you permission to not do something. If you need permission to create a not to do list, by all means, go ahead. And if there's something that you don't like to do, go ahead and put that in the chat. We'd love to hear what is on your not to do list. The other thing we're going to talk about here, really important for entrepreneurs, number nine on my list of 10 things new and aspiring entrepreneurs need to know is how to manage your stress. Yes. Every business owner I have ever met started their business for an important reason, most of those reasons being very altruistic. One of my favorite stories that's in my book, Flux the Freelance, is about Amy Zimmerman and her business, Pop and Z's. So Amy started her business. She's a Wisconsin-based business. She started her business because she was recognizing that her special needs son was going to need employment. And she couldn't see how he was going to be able to find a job where he could feel safe, where he could feel like he was contributing to the community, to himself, to his family. So she started a business so he could have a place to work. Incredible story. Look her up, Amy Zimmerman, Pop and Z's, her stories in my book. But the reason she started it was to make her life better, to make her family's lives better. And I tell you, every single entrepreneur I have ever met started their business for reasons that are similar to those. There are not very many out there who say, I want to make a ton of money. That's my focus. And even if it is, in most cases, it's because they want to be able to serve others 
with the, that money. It's not just about making the money. It's I can serve more people if I can make more money. I could volunteer if I could make more money in lesser amount of time. Okay, a little bit of a tangent there, but we're talking about managing stress. So you started your business for a good reason. If you overwhelm yourself, if you get stressed out, if you get burnt out, you're not going to be any good to anyone. So it's really important aspiring and new entrepreneurs manage their stress. Just as we said, you have to manage your time. You have to manage your stress. How do we do that? Let me give you just, just three things. I'm just going to give you three things to manage your stress. It goes back to the basics. One of those that we soon forget, though, is how to play. It's really, really important. There will always be problems to solve. There will always be deadlines to hit. There will always be a never-ending list of tasks to finish. They're not going away. Your to-do list will always be there. But give yourself permission to put it aside, to not think about work, to not talk about work, to not even read about work. Remember, too, that play results in increased productivity. Ask yourself, in my play time, in my downtime, in my recreation time, can I include people who are important to me? If I said, I want to start my business where I can have more time with my family, am I spending time with my family? One thing on my personal sovereignty list is I do not work nights and weekends, unless there's a really good reason. I do not work nights or weekends. Connect with your people who are important to you. Think about who am I surrounding myself with? Am I surrounding myself with emotional vampires or am I surrounding myself with people who refresh me? Choose the people in your playtime. We can't always choose the people in the rest of our life, but choose the people you want in your playtime. And remember the best things in life happen in between our tasks. Those moments we need to intentionally set aside for the people who are most important to us. Okay, second exercise. Of course, exercise fits in with, with all the other things that we do to take care of ourselves. We need to get enough sleep. We need to eat right. But exercise is really important. And unfortunately, it's one of the first things we cut when we're busy or we're stressed out. But exercise makes us feel less stress. It helps us to feel strong. People often say that they don't have time to exercise. But research shows that people who do exercise are actually better at balancing all of the rest of the demands in their life, both at work and at home than are those who skip working out. Don't skip the workout. And you can make that fun too. Your exercise doesn't have to be going to the gym and working on the treadmill. I hate going to the gym and walking on the treadmill. You can, you can swim. You can go for a walk with family and friends. You can take your lunch break outside. You can play soccer at the park. Do something active though. I'll try to be active every week, if not um, three or four times a week, if not every day. Third, managing your stress. Take time to reflect. Um, some of the business owners I talk to say that they forget to recognize all the good things that they have because they always are just keep striving for more and more and more. They want to get better and better and better. They don't stop to say, hey, I've actually come really far. I was way over there and now I'm here. Look at that. I'm doing good. And also taking time to reflect manages your stress. Um, after spending four days in the wild, disconnected from any sort of digital technology, students performed 50% better on problem solving tests. Just spending time in nature improves our mood and our generosity. So do you spend time, especially now it's beautiful. Get outside for lunch as soon as we're done, get outside, take a lap around your house. Sometimes that's all I have time to do is quick lap around the house, do it. You'll feel better. Do you spend time journaling, introspection, praying, reflecting? Do what you need to do to help you to better manage your stress. Um, manage your stress, manage your time, and, and make sure that those important things are on your schedule as well, because managing your stress and managing your time are important for a new and aspiring entrepreneur. So number 10, tell people. Interestingly enough, a lot of the new business owners or aspiring business owners I meet and have known over the years, one of the first things that they want to do is make a business card, which is fine. But that says something. That says, I'm ready to tell people, I'm ready to give someone something tangible that says, this is who I am and this is what I do. So find a way to tell the world. It's something you should be proud of, you should be passionate about. Now you've thought about your personal sovereignty, you've thought about your mission and vision and values, you've thought about what makes you different. 
you've thought about your unique selling proposition, why you're important, how you're fixing a need in the community. Now, after you've done this work, this is the time to tell everyone. And the 11th step is to actually do it, is to actually quit your day job. And I'm not gonna say it's easy. I know it's not. There have definitely been plenty of sleepless nights in my life, but I also wouldn't change it for anything in the world. And most entrepreneurs will tell you the same thing. So get out your calendar, pick a day, put a big X on it and tell someone you trust or tell me I'm here. If you want to let me know what your dream is, I'd be happy to hear it. You're welcome to put it in the chat, or send me an email. It's Tara at FletcherConsulting.com, T-E-R-R-A, Tara at FletcherConsulting.com. I'd love to hear about what your dream is. I also want to remind you that it's important to like that bee wolf. It's important to pop back up, take that big picture view of what's going on around us and consider how, how I can get to where I wanna be. So I wanna thank you all for spending your time with me today. I wanna to thank you for daydreaming with me. Um, thanks, Sophia. I wanna thank you for daydreaming with me. I just put up my, my references and resources up there for you so you can see. Um, I do have my book Flex of Freelance out there available for you. And there's a lot more references and resources for you in that book as well. You'll find a lot of them on, on my website, my YouTube channel too, absolutely free. But I wanna thank you. Uh, I hope you found some value in 10 things new and aspiring entrepreneurs need to know. Daydream, get that dream out of your head, connect with those financial experts, honor your personal sovereignty, know what makes you different, meet with experts, freelance, charge what you're worth, keep track of everything, prioritize, manage your time, manage your stress, and tell the world about what you do. And I can't wait to hear that you quit your day job. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Tara. I know we have some time left over for questions. We'll give some people a few moments to get those in. Um, again, thank you for, for sharing those, those, those tips um, that, that you have utilized, uh, Tara. I had a, a question for you. So, you know, you gave a lot of really good um, systems that, that, that tied in, in, into each other. One thing that I know myself I struggle with is, um, uh, you know, being disciplined enough, right? Like, I know that I need to do something. I know that I, 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 I need to be, you know, exercising, what have you. So I'm wondering if maybe you could share some, some tips or tricks um, that you use for, for discipline when you have to do those tasks or those things that maybe aren't as, as cool or as fun as some of the other tasks that you have to do throughout your day. Sure. Oh, Andy, thank you so much. That is such a good question. And I imagine for you too, you've got a lot going on in your house. You've got a little one. Like a lot of us, we are busy. We are busy and it's so hard to do those things that we think are important. Um, one thing that has helped me when thinking about goals, um, you mentioned something like that's hard, like exercise. Yes, that's hard. It is really hard. Um, I have found routines really help. Once it's part of your routine, it doesn't seem like a big deal. So for me, when it came to writing my books and working on my third one now, that was really hard for me to carve out the time because I felt like I felt like I was being selfish because it's not like I'm getting directly paid for writing a book, even though it's a very important part of what I do, it was hard for me to carve out that time. So I found I had to really make it routine and tell myself that it was okay to spend that time on me. And unfortunately, I had to carve that time out earlier in the morning. So that meant things like getting up at 530 in the morning, which to me is really early and it's really painful. But I knew it was something that I had to do. I knew it was something I had to do. Another thing that's really helpful for those tough goals is the way that we set them. So not a good goal. Not a good goal would be like, I want to lose 20 pounds. Terrible goal. It's a terrible goal. A better goal would be, I want to be healthy for my kids. My son is 13. He kicked my butt. We went for a run on Sunday and I'm like dying. I like trying to keep up with this kid. So that's a big part of my goal right now is I want to be healthy for him. I want to keep up with my kids. I want to be the mom who's active and doing things with them. Uh, similar with writing a book, my the book shouldn't be to or the goal shouldn't be to write a book. The goal should be to be a writer. When a goal impacts your identity, you're a lot more likely to stick with that goal. So make it a part of your identity. My goal is to be healthy. My goal is to be active. My goal is to be a writer. My goal is to be a runner, not to run a marathon. So identity goals are much more likely to stick with too. Good question. Yeah, thank you for that. I I know a little bit 
or a lot of it. So something that, that's helped me is if I know there's probably some Simon Sinek fans out there, but, but making sure that your why is strong enough. I know you mentioned, um, you know, the goal of losing 20 pounds as opposed to being healthy for your for your child. What has really stuck with me and helped me in particular has been like, OK, if I want to do something and maybe it's not motivating, really thinking about why it is that I want to do that mm -hmm. and really spending time on that. And if I can come up with a why in five minutes, I'm wondering if I, you know, you could probably come up with this stronger, more convicting why in 15 or 20 minutes, too. So thank you for, for sharing that. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a really good point. And I love Simon Sinek. He's fantastic. If, if you don't know Simon Sinek, look him up. He's got some great YouTube videos too. The why one is really good. And yeah, that I think, Andy, you probably feel the same way I do too, that we have to frame it the right way. Um, a lot of us are interested in entrepreneurship be, because of those outside reasons. But even if we're not there yet, I want to remind people who maybe still are working at a, a job, maybe they don't love their job, remind yourself to be happy that you have a job. It's not, I have to go to work. It's, I get to go to work. Because I know lots of people who would like to work. Um, you know, I have neighbors who are disabled. They would love to be able to work. They can't work. So we have to be grateful for what we can do and frame it in the right way. Yeah, thank you. Gratitude. So important that we remember that. And, and especially when it's for our family, I think it's I get to, not I have to. Because a lot of people would like to be where we are. Very, very important. Um, yeah, we still got a few more minutes here. If anybody had any any questions for Tara, go ahead and raise your hand or just come off mute or pop it in the chat if you'd like to do that. Um, you know, Tara, here at Dream Bank, we are a uh, community that is built of fellow fearless dreamers. And we always like to ask our speakers, what's one piece of advice that you have for someone who's actively pursuing a dream right now? Mm. Um, I think the biggest thing is to get it on paper. I think it, a dream can't become reality if it only stays in your head. Um, so get it on paper and then sign and date it because then you're really going to commit yourself to it too and put it somewhere visible, whether it's on your fridge or at your computer or on your mirror, whatever it is, put it somewhere where you can see it every day. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that. Well, it doesn't look like there's been any questions that have come in. Uh, I want to go ahead and thank you, Tara, for putting together such a wonderful presentation. Thank you all for taking the time out of your day to join us here at, at Dream Bank. Um, I will go ahead. We, we, we are putting out about an, an event a day. Um, we're still mostly virtual, working on getting back into our space and hosting hybrid events once it, uh, it, 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 it makes sense for, for us. But I want to go ahead and pass along our YouTube page. So this has a good, concise location for all of uh, really a ton of our events that we've been putting out since about the end of March 2020 till, till, till current. So uh, we have nine distinct event series at Dream Bank. This happens to fall under our business series, but we also have career related um, events. We have family related events, events in Spanish. Uh, learning labs, which are kind of our how-tos or our 101s. So really trying to appeal to as many different dreamers as possible. But uh, I really encourage you, if you enjoyed this today, or if you're looking for something different to follow that YouTube link, there's a bunch of great speakers and resources that, that are on there as well. Um, but with that being said, we will go ahead and cap it there. Again, thank you everyone uh, for today's event. Really great event. Um, and with that being said, we will see you all next time. Take care. Thanks, Andy. Thank you. Bye.